Come down to Nerdy Facts. We'll get together, have a few laughs, while we talk about one of the greatest action movies ever made. Die Hard has become such a cultural phenomenon that it's difficult to describe other action movies without calling it Die Hard on a Blank, Die Hard on a Bus, Die Hard on a Plane, Die Hard in the White House, Die Hard for Kids. But with so many movies trying to die hard, maybe it's time to look back at the movie that died hardest. Despite being set during a Christmas party, Die Hard was released in the summer on July 15, 1988. For a film that's so action heavy, it's interesting to note that the script was actually adapted from a novel by Roderick Thorpe called Nothing Lasts Forever, which is itself a sequel to a different novel called The Detective. Even more interesting, The Detective was also adapted into a film prior to Die Hard, back in 1968, starring Frank Sinatra as the titular character. Many elements from the book have been changed, but one could technically consider Die Hard a sequel to the earlier film, or at least a gritty reboot for the franchise. And stay calm, this is simply the beginning. In the book, instead of thieves pretending to be terrorists for some convoluted reason, they're just straight up terrorists facing off against a super cop. This was changed in the film because director John McTiernan felt real terrorists would make the film less fun and give it a political angle. Super cop Joe Leland was also changed to everyday man John McClane, as the director felt audiences would relate to the character more. In addition, it is the protagonist's daughter who is held hostage in the book, not his wife, and in the end, Gruber pulls her off the building with him, killing her. The change was most likely made because of the near-death experience screenwriter Jeb Stewart had after a fight with his wife. He realized that if he had died, he'd never have been able to apologize to her, and use that as the main motivation for the characters in the film. You always ask as many questions, Argyle. <laughs> when casting for the roles, Hans Gruber was initially offered to Sam Neill of Jurassic Park fame. It wasn't until McTiernan and producer Joel Silver attended a performance of Dangerous Liaisons that they discovered Alan Rickman. Die Hard was the first film of Rickman's career, and he immediately injured himself on his very first scene. McLean's role was offered to nearly every working actor in Hollywood, including Michael Keaton, Alec Baldwin, Ron Perlman, and Liam Neeson. Ultimately, Willis was chosen because his work on the comedy series Moonlighting made him seem like an unlikely hero. The film takes place in Nakatomi Tower, which was actually just the headquarters for 20th Century Fox. Because the director wanted to use extra loud blanks in all of the guns in order to achieve hyper-realism, the crew had to constantly apologize for the gunfire to the people working in the offices below them. These blanks actually caused a few problems. For one thing, they were so loud that Rickman would uncontrollably flinch every time he fired a gun, forcing the director to smash cut away from his face each time. In addition, due to his close proximity to constant gunfire, Bruce Willis sustained permanent damage to his hearing. Shit! Willis also had a hard time breaking a window with a chair during one scene and actually broke the chair before the window. Because he was shooting moonlighting alongside the film, he was constantly exhausted on set. To help lighten the load on Willis, the writers expanded the parts for characters like Al Powell, Ellis, Argyle, and Richard Thornburg, allowing their personalities to shine through and ultimately improving the film. I'm kicking it down the garage. What's the word with you and your lady, man? His stuntman wasn't safe for mishap either. The scene in which McLean falls down a shaft was an accident. The stuntman was supposed to grab the first vent, but slipped. The shot was used anyway and edited to make it so that he grabbed the next one. Thankfully, no one was harmed when McLean runs across broken glass, as Bruce Willis wore special rubber shoes designed to look like feet during the scene. Finally, it wouldn't truly be a hazardous set unless one of the actors was tricked to get a better reaction, which is exactly what happened to Alan Rickman. For his lethal drop from Nakatomi Tower, Rickman actually fell 21 feet onto an airbag. However, instead of dropping him on the count of three, like they promised, they dropped him on the count of two, inciting the look of pure terror on his face. Oh, I hope that's not a hostage. In spite of, or because of all of this, the film was a huge success. Even overseas, where the title has been changed to Crystal Jungle in France and The Glass Trap in Poland. In Germany, they changed more than the title. While the German used in the film was mostly gibberish, it was fixed for the VHS release. Still, Germany went as far as to edit out the Germans entirely, describing them as simply European. While John McClane's trademark catchphrase has been listed among the 100 best movie lines of all time, Reginald Vell Johnson's love of Twinkies has become something of his own trademark. He stated that fans will just sometimes hand him Twinkies, often saying that he probably wanted one. Even the tank top that John McClane wears in the film has become iconic. 
In fact, in 2007, Willis donated the blood-soaked tank top to the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian for all fans to pay their respects. That's it for this edition of Nerdy Facts Presents. Be sure to let us know what topics you'd like us to cover, and don't forget to subscribe to see more videos and click on the bell icon to get notified when we release the next one.